I'd like to call the um, planning and zoning meeting to order at seven o'clock. Is my microphone on? Yes. Seated tonight, we have Ryan Deasy, Chuck Sheen, myself, Ben Philbrick, Lynn Conway, and Gary Bilkey is sitting in for Fred Dykeman. And Marge is here as an alternate. Thank you, Marge. Keith, what do we have up first? I will hold it closer. You're welcome. Uh, under old business item 6A PZ 2203 BR Toll Brothers Old Mystic Estates uh, application for release of performance and maintenance bond posted to satisfy requirements of proposed construction activity related to PZ 0360 SD SUP and GPP Meehan Group LLC. Um, bond instrument is a letter of credit reduced to $310,290 on November 16th, 2021, requesting full release of bond amount. Um, so this request is for um, the Old Mystic, Old Mystic Estates subdivision. Um, it's for full release of the performance bond posted for construction of the public improvements. Um, the original amount was over, was almost three million. Um, reduced a few times by the commission over the years, and it's now three hundred and ten thousand two hundred ninety dollars. Um, this is the really the last meeting the commission has to decide on this. Um, by state statutes, the town has sixty-five days from the date of receipt to decide. Um, basically, the statutes say you either return the money or you. Um, send a letter to the applicant stating what still has to be done. Um, as I said, this is the performance bond, which is really to cover the cost of building the roads and the basins and the public improvements like that. Um, I won't get into the whole history of the development here. Um, now we sent this out for comments to different departments. We got comments back from the town engineer saying he's in support of the reduction. Um, there's a small portion of unraveled pavement that has been agreed for repair by Mike Zamola, the project manager, when the construction season begins. Uh, therefore, this maintenance item can be covered under the maintenance bond. Um, and that's another thing to mention is that uh, Toll Brothers has also submitted a maintenance bond of over $146,000. And that bond is a safeguard against defective workmanship for a year after acceptance of the roads. Because that's the idea here is that um, they will petition the Board of Selectmen to accept the roads here. Um, and then we'll hold on to that maintenance bond for another year. Um, we also received comments from the zoning official. Uh, her comments were, under no circumstances should the bond be reduced any further. There are too many issues with failure to, re to maintain erosion and sedimentation controls. Construction is ongoing, and all of the lots have, uh, have not been conveyed. Now, um, there have been erosion and sedimentation control issues there. Um, both in the Toll Brothers section and in the section which is now owned and being worked on by another firm, EG Home. Uh, those are ongoing. There's a lot of issues with Whitehall Pond on the other side of Route 27, which is all silted up and has to be addressed. However, there is a separate erosion and sedimentation control bond for um, $38,500 that Toll posted years ago, and that's never been reduced. Um, so it seems like that's the bond to cover those sorts of things if they don't get addressed rather than the performance bond, which is more about building the roads, building the basins. Um, we're also still holding um, a couple of bonds related to the off-site drainage improvements, which were done across 27. Um, and also holding a, a separate driveway apron and sidewalk bond of over $77,000. Um, let's see here. Let's 
So I'm still confused. There's three separate bonds, a sidewalk, the maintenance. <laughs> and they yeah, there are a lot of, there the are a lot of different ones that we're still holding. Okay. And they're only requesting the money back for this one performance bond. Right, okay. Which That's basically covers that. But I'm a little concerned about the zoning enforcement, yeah. the zoning officials comment. Mm -hmm. Is the money's left over going to satisfy her concerns with? Uh, it should. It was priced out when the subdivision began um, to cover those ENS issues. Um, and I should say that uh, Mike Zamola from Toll Brothers is here if there's any questions of the so applicant. So when were the bonds originally priced out? That's, this has been going on for several years. Yeah, I, it was, you know, 2011 so or so. The chances of those bonds covering Mm. Sure. The remaining work are slim to no. none. Yeah. Um, is, I, I'm not sure, personally, I'm not sure mm. why we would reduce this at all until all work is completely finished. Um, well, one thing is that the erosion and sedimentation control bond was based upon the entire development, and half of it's been done for a year or two. Uh, there's a section of Nautilus Way, about half of the road, uh, which has been completed for a while. It's been accepted by the town over a year ago. So um, what we're dealing with now is sort of the western half of Nautilus in the other little cul-de-sac that comes off of Nautilus. I'm sorry, Keith, what was the zoning, the zoning official's objection? What, what was it for? Um, the erosion and sedimentation control issues. Okay. But that has a separate bond, correct? It does. Okay. But is there anything prohibiting uh, the current bond that we're discussing from being used for sediment, the sediment? It, you know, the thing that gets in the way is the bond was intended to cover the cost of those public improvements, which is really a separate issue. Um, right, and since, and since that cost, that bond probably will not cover those costs, and we have this bond, and it's all one project, uh, again, all the work is not, not completed on this project, and I'm not sure we should be given any, any uh, reduction in bonds at all. I mean, once again, it's not complete. It's been several years. Are they trying to wrap it up? Is there active work? They are. I mean, they're, they're trying to um, dedicate the remaining roads to the town, which can be done prior to the houses being done. You know, the houses don't have to be done to do this. Any other comments or questions? How do we want to proceed with this? Oh, I have a question. It's so in reading this, it looks like if we were going to deny their requests, and we would have to specifically state what, what our denial reasons are, correct? Right. And that's where it gets dicey and not returning it for erosion and sedimentation control reasons when we have a separate bond for that. Um, you know, if you look at page nine of the staff report it's sort of the punch list of things to be done for this but every box is not punched it is for this it is for the public improvements i thought you said that they had thought that they would they plan plan to finish the road but it has not happened i believe that was your first statement Well, the road is... I think you said that the plan was for curbs mm -hmm. and whatnot to be finished in the spring. That's oh. what you said originally. Yeah, that was the town engineer's comment just about um, fixing some uh, unraveling pavement where it's mm -hmm. sort of crumbling a little in one section and it can't be fixed until the spring. There's work to be done. Would it be worth, I mean... Would it make sense for us to use that as a reason if we wanted to deny it until that unraveling pavement is fixed? Mm -hmm. That seems like an awful lot 
for that, but that would be the only reason I could see that would make sense for this type of bond. Does the town engineer, I, just to, to your comment, Ryan, does the town engineer specifically say he recommends reducing or, or you know, uh, releasing the bond? Uh, yes. He says, I'm, I'm in support of the reduction of the bond. Um, and just that if necessary, the cost of un, that unraveling pavement in that section can be covered under the maintenance bond. So it's really, in this case, probably the town engineer that has, has more jurisdiction over public improvements than, than anyone else. Not to discount. I mean, I am concerned with the zoning enforcement officer's confusion over the erosion and sediment control, sediment control uh, bond, which is separate. And I, I, I guess I'd feel more comfortable if that was clarified before we voted on any of them, to Lynn's point. Yeah, agreed. And, and can it be tabled till the next meeting? Uh, I don't think so. Unfortunately, no, because of the time frame. Being a guy who likes to compromise, can we reduce half of the bond that they're requesting and keep half? Or is it being so 300,000 what, 10? I guess it would be kind of arbitrary, you know, yeah. because you don't really have a scientific estimate of th there's almost nothing mm -hmm. that we can do that's based on science here numbers, because the yeah. town engineer has said release it in full. Um, so he's confident that the maintenance bond will fix the rattling and other, yeah. other issues. Yeah. The okay. zoning enforcement officer's comments do concern me. Mm. I mean, and there, can you can you repeat? Comment from the zoning enforcement officer? It was under no circumstances should be should the bond be reduced any further. Okay, so I'm I'm thinking, you know, it's a pretty strong statement. Yeah. But she's concerned with the ENS, the erosion and right. that's sedimentation. Not. Right? That's it's correct. It's that's what she's saying. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. To and get that, back to Ryan's point, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that I agree that a maintenance bond can be used to, to fix something that needs to be rebuilt. So it might, it might constitute a reason to deny it with the understanding that, that all of these elements have to be resolved by the time it comes back to us. I mean, but the town engineer did recommend. Mm. And there is a small bond, right, for the 38,000 you said for the erosion and soil? Which is? Uh, yes. Which, let's face it, it's right. not going to cover. We couldn't use this money for that anyway. We, the, the, it's bonded separately, so yeah, we couldn't, separately. in other words, yeah. let's assume we held this money and there was a sediment and erosion control problem and the developer says, I'm not doing it. And, and the town says we're going to call the bond. The only bond you can call is the erosion and sediment control bond, not the performance bond for the public improvements. Yeah, I think that's a good point when it comes to sort of mixing the, yeah. mixing the two pots of money. Yeah. And by denying it, we need a legal reason or we need? You have to state on the record why. why? The right, right. Mm -hmm. It seems to me the only reason we could logically deny it would be the unraveling pavement. That's, I don't honestly know if there's, <laughs> and that that's it, that it'd be fully, fully repaired prior to, yeah. uh, you know, requesting a release of the bond. And is there a representative from Toll Brothers here this evening? Yes. Would you like to have a comment for us? Why don't you wait to get to the microphone, please? Mike Zamola with Toll Brothers, Senior, Land, Deve Senior Land Development Manager. Um, so as, as Keith had said, there is currently a performance bond in place for $310,290. That's related to the performance issues. There's also a $38,500 bond related to erosion controls. And there's also an additional erosion control bond for offsite improvements that's still in place that we're not requesting back. 
I do understand that there was a comment about the bond being older from 2011 with the bond amount. But that bond at this point at 38.5 on top of the additional 27,000 is still going to be in place. When's that work going to be done? They're just being, ever, all the work is 100% complete with the project. All work related to the roads, every item that is listed on the performance bond is 100% complete. That's the reason why the town engineer recommended its release. But what about, what about the, um, the uh, water the, on the other side, the $38,000 bond? So those issues were brought up by the zoning enforcement official. Mm -hmm. If you look at the date of that comment, I believe it's on 211. Those issues were resolved since that comment. There has been no further comment. I did speak with the zoning official subsequent to that and upon uh, receipt of the report for this meeting tonight. Those issues have been resolved. However, we are still allowing that bond to remain in place should other issues arise along with the other bonds. So there will be, on top of, you know, if you compile all of the bonds, there's going to be about $300,000 in bonds that we're leaving in place. They were being left in place. Left in place. That's right, yeah. With the release, you know, of, of the, the 310 to 290. Right now, there's about $700,000 in bonds. Okay. And all work is going to be. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you. So Thank you. For the, for the record, the ZEO did just today, uh, like just this afternoon, give uh, notices of violation to tolls and the other developer for ENS issues, but still same. For what issues? I'm sorry. Our erosion and sedimentation issues. For, for toll, it was just uh, repairing fa failed erosion and sedimentation fences at a couple of the addresses, which is a quick fix thing. Those are ongoing maintenance items. Things happen over time. Mm -hmm. Silt fence. That's a regular maintenance item, always needs to be repaired. Mm -hmm. We do address those issues as things are ongoing. We still own lots on the property. Mm -hmm. But we're not requesting that bond to be released. It's the performance bond, which has direct items tied to the roadway improvements. Performance and maintenance. That's maintenance. That's for erosion control, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's also, like I said, the maintenance bond for $146,000. Right. <clears throat> right, which is in place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. What would the board like to do? I'll make a motion to approve uh, the application as written. I don't see right now if the town engineer's checked off on it, um, and he's you know confident that they've met all the punch list items, and the conversation he had with the other officer and. and She's good with you know what they're doing, and the ongoing work is covered by the other maintenance. And I say we approve it. So I make a motion to approve as is. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. So I'm just going to. I think we've we've run into this before with other developments, where we've come, we've we've had discussion. We've had a punch list. It's almost done. It's not quite done. It gets done when we don't release the bond. This has been an ongoing project for some years. Maybe it's a small thing, but it's not 100% complete. And so I think we should deny it based on that. It doesn't say we have to list 10 items. It doesn't say that we have to list, you know, a certain amount of money still has to be has to be uh, used in order to you know in order to say you you can't release the bond that's not what it says it says we have to say why we're not list, uh, releasing the bond and we have a reason so and what would the reason be then what would your stated reason be the the ongoing curbs then they're not done and again, Except, this is a long-term project that we're looking at here. Yeah. This isn't something that was wrapped up in six months, et cetera. This has been an ongoing um, project with the town. There have been a lot of issues. So I, 
I personally think that we hold the bond until everything's done. We have justification for it. That's a good point. Mike, going back to the photograph of the unraveling Keith, is that the new road or the accepted road? That's, that's the new road. The yellow, the unaccepted part. The yellow, yeah. So in that case, the maintenance bond would cover it. But it it's, hasn't been accepted. No, well, it hasn't been accepted, but but uh, you have to have a reason to deny this, and I have the same apprehensions Lynn has. But the problem that I the problem that I have is there. The I don't think there's a valid reason to deny it. And the town the town engineer has said that the maintenance bond covers the items that are defective, and he's submitted a detailed estimate that shows all of the work that is covered by the performance bond is 100 percent complete. And he's attest to that. And there is money left over for the, so, yeah. for the maintenance. Yeah. Maintenance of. So, so we have a maintenance yes. bond to cover the yeah. issues and a sediment and erosion control bond mm -hmm. to cover the zoning enforcement mm -hmm. offer, officer's issues. But I, I, I share some of Lynn's, Lynn's concerns. I, you know, I second this motion because I don't think, I don't think there's a reason, a valid reason and a fair reason to deny it. I just. And that's that's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. And there's money that's left over. I, there's still almost three hundred thousand left over for that. Yeah. yeah. Express purpose of maintenance and before we release that. Well, it's all chunked out in different ways, but it's there. Right. Chunked out. <laughs> right. Well, we have a motion seconded. Is there? Shall we uh, vote on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those Post. to deny. One to deny. So moved. I admit I jumped right over the minutes from our last meeting and our, my excitement to get the meeting going. <laughs> so would somebody care to uh, correct me on getting the order straight and make a motion about last meeting's minutes? Make a motion to approve the minutes uh, as written and presented. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Item 6B, PZ2205 SPA, C Research Foundation. Um, this is a site plan for uh, Mystic Aquarium, 55 Coogan Boulevard. Um, just recommend. Uh, Tabling, we're just waiting for uh, town engineer comments, basically. Um, that just brings us to the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Sergio Terenzia with Terenzia and Associates offices at 99 Mechanic Street in Pawkatuck. Um, we understand that the application before you this evening uh, for the Mystic Aquarium is going to be tabled. I believe the only thing that we're awaiting is uh, town engineer comment. Um, we just wanted to, um, and, and with me here tonight is uh, Keith Sorensen, Senior Vice President of uh, Facilities and Capital Projects. Um, we just wanted to uh, respectfully request that we could be heard as, as soon as the next meeting, if it is at all possible. Um, I know that I, I believe in speaking with your planner um, that there is uh, maybe one agenda item at the April 5th meeting. We didn't know if we would be able to get on that agenda. Uh, the aquarium does have a, a schedule of getting to construction and we were hoping that we could be um, heard as soon as possible given some hefty agendas coming up, I believe in the next month or two. Okay, thank you. We'll see what thank, we can do. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah, thank you. Do we need a motion to table either of these two? Don't we don't so. need one. No. No. Okay. Did you? Uh, as uh, Sergio said, I am uh, Keith Sorensen, Senior Vice President of Facilities Capital Projects for Mystic Aquarium. 
Uh, I'll just add that, um, and, and Sergio uh, said this to some extent, that um, we have a small window of time to get this project done at the end of the summer. It's in a public space. And um, while we could shut down and, and get into it early, we don't want to do that. Hence, we got in as soon as we possibly could um, for this hearing. Um, we uh, did meet with town staff early on, Keith and town engineer and others, to try to identify any issues that might, we might encounter and get those out of the way early. So uh, again, I would reiterate that you please consider um, the next meeting, which I believe is the 4th. Uh, April 5th. 5th, I'm sorry, um, for us to be on that meeting. Appreciate your consideration, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you both. And Keith, what about the 7A that's being pushed out to the next meeting? We don't need to reread that right. the record or anything. So the public hearing uh, item 7A, that's for uh, 29 Old Stonington Road. Um, the applicant requests uh, continuation, continuation to the April 19th hearing, and they've granted an extension to allow us more time to do okay. that. Um, this hearing's already been opened so at a previous already, meeting. Okay. That brings us to the public hearing. Lynn, would you like to read that into the record, please? Pursuant to general statutes of the State of Connecticut Revision of 1958 and all amendments thereto, and pursuant to the zoning regulations of the Town of Stonington, Connecticut, the Planning and Zoning Commission hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing at the Stonington Board of Education District Office, 40 Field Street, Pawkatuck, Connecticut, on Tuesday, March 15, 2022, at 7 p.m. on the following application. PZ 2204 SPA Latizori Development Site Plan Application for Construction of 123 Unit Residential Apartment Building, Harbor Heights 2, Parking Access Drive, Swimming Pool, Utility stor Stormwater Management, Lighting, Landscaping, and Site Improvements. Property located at 50 Perkins Farm Drive, Mystic Assessors Map 150, Block 2, Lots 2 and 3, and Map. 134 block 3 lot 4 zone gdd great thank you lynn um to review how this all works there should be a sign up sheet up at the door for all those who would like to speak in favor against or general comments and then we will um have the applicant give their case their presentation then the public will have input in favor, opposed, general comments, leaving time for rebuttal from the applicant. We'll ask the staff to have their input. The board will have their questions, including alternates. We will then close the hearing and the commission will discuss it and go to a vote. All yours, David. Oh, excuse me, I did forget who's seated tonight. <laughs> I'm rusty. <laughs> so we have Ryan Deasy, Chuck Sheehan, myself, Ben Philbrick, Lynn Conway, and Gary Bilkey are seated tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. Um, it's good to be before you again, which hopefully will be my last time. I'm sure you're getting tired of me. Um, I always say we should have a standing reservation, but uh, hopefully that won't be necessary. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to kind of just quickly run through again where we've been with this project. Uh, we got our zoning text amendment in 2016, which allowed for the Greenway Development District. Uh, that accompanied a master plan uh, approval in January of 2017. And then for this site, Harbor Heights, we're going to call it Harbor Heights East just for ease of reference. Uh, the phase one site plan was approved on March of 2018. And we just had the uh, master plan modification approved, and now we're going for our site plan approval. What we're referring to tonight, let's see if I can figure this out, 
is subzone number three, which is the village housing, which was expanded to allow for an additional 124 units. On the adjacent parcel in between the Hartford Healthcare expansion and the current Harbor Heights, we'll call it West, or Harbor Heights phase one apartment complex. Open space has remained the same as well as the other subzones. The master plan was approved uh, back in November and it allowed for um, these additional 123 units, although we're allowed up to 124 units, we're only requesting 123. It should be noted that this is actually the most secluded area of the site. Um, it's loaded in the most located in one of the most interior sections of it and not abutting any residential neighbors. It's fully surrounded by other communities within the campus. This building is actually further from uh, I-95 to the north. That allows for a reduction in noise. Um, actually, all our buildings, we have an acoustical engineer which studies the STC ratings of all the windows. And we predict uh, around 30% less noise to these units in the front and res normal residential noises uh, on the east, west, and on the southern side where the courtyard is. It also has the added benefit of acting as a sound buffer to Jerry Brown Road, so it will actually um, buffer more of the highway noise, which we hope will continue to reduce noise impacts along Jerry Brown and also to our neighbors to the south at Stone Ridge. The idea with putting this parcel here and combining the medical into one building is that we could actually provide housing for people who work on this site or patients who want to live next door. As you heard at our last hearing, we have majority of our uh, residents are actually empty nesters. As one resident told me, uh, it's nice living next to a coffee shop, but it's even nicer living next to my doctor when uh, something goes wrong with me every day. So I hope that's not the case, but it, we do allow that. Um, remember that the medical access drive does not continue into the residential component of the site. And the reason is, is we wanted the commercial and residential sections of the site to be separate. This also alleviated some of the traffic that was being directed to Coogan and directed primarily all of the residential access points out onto Jerry Brown Road, North Pequot Seapost, where we've had no traffic issues. There is emergency access here and here. This allowed us to put in a park, the America, Americo Petroselli Memorial Park, which is named after the resident at Stone Ridge, who came up with the idea for uh, this project and helped guide me through the approval process and he's since passed away, but this would be a nice way to remember him and also to provide a community area for our residents, for patients and for staff at Hartford Healthcare. Um, the entire site is linked by nature trails and also will be linked by a sidewalk that goes through. Um, and you'd really be surprised to see how many people use these nature trails, especially the physicians uh, and our residents when they're walking their, their dogs. This building, similar configuration as the first phase. We don't want to mess with success. We have 123 units. The orientation of this building, building is actually more desirable to phase one because it faces south. So we get southern exposure most of the day. And it's also the main viewpoint of the building is facing out towards the open space in the wetlands to the south. You should remember that it's this area has already been disturbed by the uh, utility corridor, which has currently a walking path. We have no building coming on to the southern section of this uh, utility access point. Again, it's located further away from I-95. We have large recreation center in the middle, community similar to the first phase. All the amenities that we had in the first phase, including the pool, grilling station, fireplace, gazebos, outdoor living spaces, dog parks, uh, all of it. So uh, those have been extremely successful for this project. I mentioned before that we won Apartment Community of the Year Award by the Connecticut Apartment Association, and this is really due to a lot of these amenity spaces that you don't find in a building of this size. Usually it's 200 um, units or more, but I hope to hold this for a long time, and I want to add as much value into this as possible, and uh, I don't want to mess with success. I'm going to hand it off to my uh, soil scientist and wetlands engineer, Jim Cowan, to discuss some of the environmental impacts, invasive species management that's been ongoing on the site for the last few years. Thank you. For the record, uh, James Cowan, uh, 
professional wetland scientist, registered soil scientist. I've been involved with this project since about 2010. So I've been on the site numerous times. Um, <clears throat> for this particular phase, there are no uh, wetland impacts and a wetland permit has been issued. Um, throughout the different phases of the campus, one of the concerns that we've had and, and continue to address is the incursion of invasive species. As you know, invasive species love disturbed soils. So whenever we disturb soils, we want to stabilize it, vegetate it, and manage invasives. So um, I've worked with all habitat services out of Brantford, Connecticut, uh, since um, pre-construction in terms of as we've progressed to uh, manage the invasives, particularly along the edge and in the disturbed areas. Um, we've never claimed that we were going to eradicate invasives from the whole site. It's just, it's just not realistic or possible. Um, so All Habitat Services has uh, been involved um, and I've worked with them from time to time to give them direction uh, for new phases. Um, <clears throat> and so the main approach is when an area is disturbed to stabilize it either with the temporary seed mix or in this, uh, um, or the final seed mix, which is a native uh, seed mix with grasses, wildflowers, and so forth that provide stabilization, pollinator habitat, and they don't require watering or fertilizer. They're adapted to the soils on the site. Um, so um, we'll continue to use that practice. We've specified um, the New England conservation wildlife mix for the edges um, <clears throat> of the site. Um, the landscape Berm, um, which there were questions about in the last public hearing, um, I have evaluated that, walked it, and looked at it, and the landscape berm um, is stable, um, and it's, it's been added to, so there are different stages of vegetation on that berm. Um, <clears throat> the side facing Jerry Brown Road is stable with native species. Um, some of the side slopes on the east and west and north are newer um, with added fill material. And so there have been different seed mixes and there is currently some mugwort, which is an invasive species growing on the side slopes. And so those will be addressed by all habitat services. I don't recommend planting the final seed mix until that invasive species is eliminated because it's so aggressive <clears throat> that it will just uh, outcompete what we're trying to get established. So how do you how do you get rid of mugwort? Um, herbicide is um, and which which flavor? Uh, <clears throat> there's a couple different treatments. I leave that up to all hat habitat services. Some of it depends on the time of year. Mm. Um, I've just been in conversation um, with Dave Roach, the principal of all habitat recently, and he treats in the spring the rosettes as they begin to leaf out and green up when, they, when it gets above 50 degrees. So it's just, we're just right on the cusp of the time to treat that. Um, and I don't keep up with the herbicides because it's a constantly changing environment as things are being tested. So Dave is in the forefront of that, so he will use the best, best herbicide for uh, the time of year. Uh, <clears throat> and I will note that the berm is not close to any wetland, so um, they are careful with the use of herbicide, but there is a, a buffer around the berm between it and the wetland, <clears throat> uh, wetland four and wetland five. So it's in between those two wetlands. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so um, we are aware that invasives are an ongoing 
uh, issue, and they are being managed and addressed and will continue to be. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. For the record, ma'am, my name is Todd Ritchie. I'm a registered professional engineer in Connecticut, also board certified environmental engineer with SLR. I'll start off with, this is an existing conditions plan, um, colorized with some lines. Um, as David mentioned, this is the existing uh, Harbor Heights um, building um, for phase one. Uh, as you know, uh, we have an approved plan for phase two, which uh, has not been constructed yet and will be future construction, which will extend it to the east to the property line of this yellow line, which is the outline of the properties which will be the home of um, Harbor Heights Phase 2. Those properties will be merged um, together for um, the, a single property for, the, for Phase 2. And over here is Harbor Heights Phase 1 and the townhouses, I forget the street there, but um, down to the south here. Um, as you can see, we have wetlands here, here, and we have the 100-foot regulated area here and here from wetlands. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Callan, we did go before inland wetlands uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, received unanimous approval for this project. The site area uh, altogether for the, the, uh, this outline here, for the yellow uh, proposed single lot for the development, is uh, approximately 5.8 acres that, that we'll get into um, showing the disturbed area the proposed disturbed area is si approximately six acres which is beyond the boundary of just that lot so if you're wondering why uh, it's six greater than the size of the, uh, the lot area itself the building footprint and I'll go on to the next um, this is just a splash page so you can see what the ultimate build out will look like in true color um, so it gives you kind of like a, a good idea of, um, of um, where everything is located. I'll go into more detail, but we have the, um, the access drive, which currently ends here, that will continue, as shown on previous master plan, and uh, service the front main entrance here. And then we'll have a uh, up gradient tiered parking lot. Uh, so it's multi-level here. And we have some retaining walls along the east. Uh, step retaining walls and then towards the west we have uh, the grade will decline down to the existing grades that will be at the borderline with Hartford Healthcare phase two property. This is the site layout um, as you can see um, we have the parking lot here and along here and as well here the entrances on the west are here and here and this will just be, as David mentioned, for uh, emergency access or just a, 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 a some egress or, uh, or folks will drive in and out periodically. But the main entrance is here and accessed by this driveway here. Um, we have a total of 123 units, as was mentioned. The footprint of the building itself is 42,130 square feet. The floor, gross floor area is 155,332 square feet. There's a total of 214 parking spaces. Of those spaces, 13 spaces are um, handicap accessible. We've positioned handicap accessible um, spaces at each building entrance, right here on the east, and then here at the main entrance, and then here on the west side, so each side of the building. There was one entrance that um, had some issues with grades, so the ability to have accessibility to that one entrance um, was limited. Um, cut and fill, net cut, because we will be cutting into the existing grade and put, installing retaining walls, is 30,000 cubic yards. And we're proposing, as we'll discuss, uh, the extent, expansion of that berm, as we mentioned at the previous um, public hearing for the master plan uh, that was a I believe favorably received uh, to expand that berm in the east-west direction uh, parallel to um, the, um, the street uh, and 
to the south, and so that we can uh, provide more screening and a, a better buffer uh, visually to the north. Excuse me, what will the new height of the new berm be, the same as the height of the... It will the be, uh, I think we mentioned last time, it will be a couple feet higher. Uh, the other berm was approved for a couple feet higher, but it actually wasn't at the max height. So this berm will be a couple feet higher than, than the other berm. But we're not going to elevate the entire, we're not proposing to elevate the entire berm, unless, of course, that would be something that you, you request. But we will be, um, as Mr. Cowan mentioned, um, overseeding and enhancing and we'll get into our landscape architect we'll get more detail about how we will be treating the burn okay. thank you this is a very complicated plan but <laughs> this is the grading and utilities plan um, as i mentioned we have the access way that comes there i should mention that the existing grades grade change from the east to the west across the site is approximately 30 feet um, so we do have to position this building in a manner that we can connect with maximum grades for driveways and parking uh, lots uh, and being able to connect to the existing grades that will be on the west side uh, the property line and to, in order to enable these connections uh, uh, we do have to position it lower in this area um, which it does benefit uh, it will be you know set lower so the building will be uh, less visible uh, which is certainly desirable. Um, it also it, it does have a consequence, which obviously is cut cut and fill, and we have to instead of balancing it on each side, most of you know, this will have to happen o over in the stepped parking lot over here, along with these um, stepped retaining walls along the access to road uh, right here. Um, as far as utilities go, sewer. We, as David mentioned, the existing this you know already disturbed utility corridor is right here that goes here and water and sewer are currently um, located there. So there's um, water, water main and sewer main in that location. Gravity sewer will connect to that existing sewer main to the south and water for domestic and fire protection will also connect to that um, water main to the south. Uh, we are proposing um, a, a booster station location here and that will provide pressure for um, Hartford Healthcare phase one and two. Um, Harbor Heights Phase 2, Harbor Heights Phase 1, and again, which is not shown here, the, the uh, townhouse neighbor, neighborhood and, and as well. So that, that's something that will be uh, uh, you know, approved in the, uh, uh, designed and approved uh, through the town engineer in the future and the utility. Um, so we just wanted to show that now because we, we did have to show it through the inland wetlands process as well. Um, stormwater, we do have stormwater controls on this uh, as part of this plan. We don't have uh, a lot of area open for uh, stormwater open um, uh, management and treatment of stormwater, but we do have sizable underground systems for storage, and these are located on the east and west side. We have catch basins with deep sumps. We have hydrodynamic separators. We have isolator rows in, in the unit, so we have redundant treatment for um, removal of solids. Uh, and we also have, um, have level spreaders at the outlets that will be uh, planted with um, grasses, salt tolerant, and so on, um, as recommended by Mr. Cowan. Um, we did model these systems as if there was no exfiltration throughout a design storm, which is uh, for us a 100-year storm, up to and including a 100-year storm. Um, and we have modeled it that it will drain within 72 hours after uh, being f um, filled, fully filled. As far as um, the berm, this is the grading of the area of the berm, as we mentioned and you've seen before. Um, this is the existing berm right here. And then we're proposing expansion of that berm in this direction over here. And as I mentioned, there's a couple of grade lines that cut across here that will show that we are elevating the berm uh, slightly higher. And these, this berm is located outside of the 100-foot upland review area on this side. So all the work that's being proposed here, although it's not under your jurisdiction for the upland review, it, you know, we've been careful to stay outside of that area. There will be a construction. There's an ent existing entrance now that uh, is here that was for construction access for previous projects. We will um, continue to use that uh, as we 
as uh, the progress on the construction uh, goes forward. Um, obviously, when they're creating the access road, they're going to need a means of, or they're going to have to move material over here to deposit whatever they're excavating in, in that area. Um, so once this starts to fill up and eventually it closes off, this, this access will be removed because it will no longer be able to have access through the berm. This is the erosion and sediment control plan. Um, as is typical, we have uh, designated material stockpile areas. There's the access way to uh, stabilized uh, road to go down to the area of the, um, the, the new berm or where the material will be deposited when it's transported from excavation areas. We have temporary sediment traps in these locations. Um, we have inlet protection silt fence all along the out, outline of the disturbed, downgrading outline of the disturbed areas and, um, and, and so on. So we, we've carefully, we also have a temporary construction fence along this area because it will be excavated and there will be quite an excavation over here. It will be probably around um, 15 to 19 feet at its highest and then as uh, John Hammer from our office will speak um, about how we've softened this uh, so because of the, the cut at the highest point, which is in this area here. Um, it will visually be uh, treated, but still during construction, there will be uh, quite an excavation in that area. We do have guardrail that will go down all the way from this point here, all the way where the walls are down, down to this location. So there'll be vehicle barrier, there'll be a, a permanent uh, four foot high chain link fence for safety um, a lot to prevent access to the walls right behind these walls and also uh, over here for these two walls that are along the uh, DOT you right. Do you have an elevation of the walls, of those retaining walls? Uh, we do have a sections that John will go through with you okay. so we can show you that. Thank you. Sure. And, uh, that's it for me. If anybody has questions right now, I'd be happy to try. Just a few. Sure. Uh, the retaining walls in the northeast corner, I think you mentioned they're in the northeast corner there, yep. and between the parking lot and the access road? Right here. Uh, I didn't see a cross section on the plans. Uh, uh, what would be the max, max height of those walls? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let John. Um, address those just so that he has the cross sections and he's been, That's working, fine. I'm he's fine been working on that. We've, um, we, just so you know, we, we have been developing this more. You may have not, may not have a set of plans that uh, has the latest. So we've been, we got feedback from the architectural review. That's board. fine. If somebody yeah. else is going to sure. address it, I'm, I'm fine with yeah. that. Thank okay. you. Uh, a couple other quick questions. The sidewalks in the northeast corner that uh, are on the east side of the road and wrap yeah. around the north side of the road, it's hard to tell with these reduced size plans scale and just it, can you confirm that they meet accessibility standards without landings? Uh, well, they meet ex the slope there is 10%. So as far as slope goes, it's, it's not going to be 5% because that's it, there's no other way to get down to the site is but to have a 10% maximum uh, driveway slope there. Um, so as far as width and, and, and um, ramps and everything else, that, that's compliant with ADA. So. so they don't meet accessibility standards? Not by grade. Okay. Mm, but, but neither would, neither would a, a sidewalk along any road that's over 5%. Well, I, under, I yeah. fully understand that. I'm just wondering if there's anything that could be done to mitigate that with, with periodic landings. Well, we could, we could have uh, pull-offs or landings, mm. you know. I mean, there are quite a few senior citizens that live in the project. And okay. It might be, might be something to consider. Um, you mentioned water supply. Could you just review that again quickly? Is there sure. a pump station in the southeast corner of the site? Yes. The proposed booster station for water is right here. Okay. And that's for both domestic and fire suppression? Correct. And has that been reviewed by Aquarion? Not yet. We've had preliminary discussions with them, and they told us that they wanted us to serve all of the buildings. So, okay. When, excuse me, Chuck, but when along those lines, when would that be completed in relation to the rest of 
of the project? That would be have to be completed as part of the project. As part of the project. Yes. Okay. The aquarium. I, I don't imagine you can get a building permit without, right. the, without <laughs> right, right. fire suppression. Yeah. So I, okay. I'm not too worried about that. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the last question, and I'm not sure if it's for you or it's the owner or for the attorney, is, is for things that aren't shown on this plan. This is, is sort of an unusual case where this is a large site and we only have a partial plan of all the property. We don't have a plan of, of the full site. And my question relates to um, the area adjacent to Jerry Brown Road, uh, particularly the tree shelf, the, the uh, snow shelf adjacent to the edge of the road. Over a portion of that, the owner has improved uh, that and it did a very nice job, restored the retaining walls and created an area where if a pedestrian were walking on that side of the street, and it's a very narrow street, and, and I don't know what the average speed of traffic is in there, but, but from my observations, just over a couple of periods during the last few weeks, it's not slow. Mm -hmm. So um, my concern is that in the areas where it isn't improved, um, I believe some of the members of the commission have felt that the owner is going to improve that wall, improve the snow shelf, so that it all meets the standards of the area that he has improved. And I would like some assurance, at least tonight, that that, that is going to take place. Because it meets an important safety concern. Sure, I'll let the owner speak to that. But I can um, just reiterate from our last hearing for the master plan approval uh, or modification, um, we did uh, we did propose to put in the flashing uh, speed signs, the radar signs. So just to help with the speed, we 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 weren't able to submit anything within 15 days of this hearing for public uh, purposes. But um, we do have materials that I will leave with the town planner after we've heard, we're heard tonight that do outline the, that improvement, which you know we're offering. And also at the uh, intersection of the uh, west uh, driveway entrance, as somebody had mentioned, they would want, they wanted like sort of a stripe refuge area on the corner for the same reasons of being able to, for safety. So we've shown that as well. Um, so, but I'll let, I'll let the owner speak specifically to your, your question. Okay, I don't mean to infer by saying that it's like a partial set of plans. It's yeah. an excellent set of plans. No, I understand. Area that it addresses. I, I don't mean to convey any of that. No. But, but for the areas that it doesn't cover, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just want to confirm that, that, you know, the commission's understanding is correct and that, that those stone walls will be rebuilt and that, that you know, the whole street will appear uh, the same as and consistent as the area that has already been improved, which I commend the owner for. I think he did an excellent job. Thank you. David Lattazori, the owner. Um, can you just clarify for me what you're referring to in terms of snow shelf? It's the area between the stone wall and the edge of pavement. So that was actually deeded over to the town of Stonington as part of their right-of-way requirements. So I do not own that land. Uh, the town gave me the uh, uh, assurance that it would be maintained. They have not maintained it. I have taken it upon myself to maintain that right away and also rebuild the entire stone walls. Um, that's actually not my land, but as a good neighbor, um, I've made that practice over this summer. I think you've seen a major improvement. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of linking this site is that we can eliminate the emergency access corridor off the southwestern corner of the Hartford Healthcare parking lot. That was a requirement of the police department, which now denies that they required that. Um, and they said it was the fire department, which now denies that they required that. Either way, there is that emergency access corridor in there that once this is linked, we will no longer need it. So my idea is to tear up that kind of stone dust gravel that we have in there, plant the same native New England conservation mix, and as long as the utility companies are fine with it, then I will recontinue the stone wall. The reason why I didn't do the section south of that emergency access corridor is because there's a lot of stumps and other trees that would take me a little bit longer to tackle. I plan to tackle that over the next year or so, so that we can add another 500 foot section of that wall. Um, you know, we maintain 90% of the stone walls on this site. I've rebuilt another 3,000 feet, including 1,500 feet in, in front of Jerry Brown Road, and I'd like to continue that down to where the old growth trees start. Um, that is my plan. Um, it is not shown on I think on you just here. said in, in fairly 
long sentence that you are going to rebuild the stone walls on your property, correct? Correct. It's now no longer my property, but I will be rebuilding the, the stone property walls. line. Is the center line of the stone wall? So, yeah. so uh, I think I think you have a substantial interest in it. So, it, it's. Uh, I appreciate the answer, and it's it's totally satisfactory. Yeah. Thank you. You know, one of the benefits of the expansion of Har the Hartford Healthcare Medical Facility, as well as this building, is now we have more people contribu contributing funds into the HOA for this campus. Um, so we can now get the best snow plowers, we can get the best landscapers, and I will be able to build another beautiful wall, um, which I will continue to do so. It, it is a beautiful job, and I Thank commended you. you before you came up to get the answer. It is a gorgeous job that you did on Thank that. You. It complements the investment that was made across the street mm -hmm. in an even more beautiful wall. Uh, and all the other abutting residences down the street that did the same thing. So I, I commend you for the work, and I'm glad to hear that you're going to continue it. If the town has a responsibility to remove the brush, I'm fine with that. Uh, I have it as part of my landscape con contract, so we'll take care of it. We've also added an additional 15 trees along that area. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that. Also, Stone Ridge had $10,000 remaining in their legal fund to fight oh. from my dad 20 years ago. They've since disbanded that, and they spent that 10 grand on planting more trees on their side. Mm -hmm. So we have a total of around 30 more trees. It's a substantive improvement uh, in the appearance of the site. It, it really is. If it's going to take time. The unimproved areas to the area that you made the investment in, it's, it's day and night. So I commend you for the work and for the commitment to do it along the entire frontage. Thank you. Great, thank you. And David, that construction road that's there now where the berm will dislocate it. Say will, that again, the construction. There's a construction access road yes. that will be eliminated. Correct. And so that stone wall section will be filled in too, I assume. There is a small section of stone wall there, um, and that will be filled in to right. create that berm. Right. But it won't encroach on the stone wall adjacent to Jerry Brown Road. And the truss gate will be removed, correct? S the steel again? truss gate will be that's, removed. That's the emergency access. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep the pavers in there, um, but I can also remove that as well. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions for Good evening. Oh, wow, that came out great. <laughs> <laughs> 15 again. <laughs> I'm not even nervous. That's the sad part. Let's just say you do this for 20 years and you think it's just going to spill out, right? So I'm John Hammer. I'm a licensed landscape architect with SLR Consulting. I work with Todd and I've been working with David on this. I've been with SLR for 20 years this year, which is pretty exciting, but not at all relevant to this. Um, I'm just excited about it. Uh, I've been a licensed landscape architect in the state for 15 years. I've worked all over the state on multiple controversial and not controversial projects. So this one's pretty exciting in that regard that it isn't. Um, so what I'm going to try to help bring some understanding to is how the site uh, sort of sits in relationship to the sites adjacent to it. Todd covered it and David covered it uh, sort of from a top down, but we have some cross sections that we ran through the site, very simple ones, but they're going to be, I think, very informative for you to understand how we've done some strategic things to maximize views from the buildings, minimize views from offsite, so on and so forth. So again, a pretty picture here. So these, this is also the site plan, which you saw before. I'll just go back and forth quick. So the first section that you'll see on the next sheet on the bottom is the long one that goes from left to right across the plan. It connects to the left side, which is the Hartford Healthcare Expansion parking lot, goes through our site, through the terraced parking on the right side of the building, our shorter retaining walls, and then the access drive sort of up at the top where the uh, phase one boulevard entry is. It's kind of grayed out there. It's hard to see. But the second section is a BB section, which goes at a 45 degree angle. And that tries to cover a view from the corner of the building, looking out through the parking lot and the corner, the bend. And then the last one is a section CC, which goes straight up towards 95, the short one. And that one we did to show the relationship of the building to the walls that are along 95. So each of these has a, a strategy to them. 
And the interesting part about this is the revised plans that we submitted were actually designed off of cross section and not off of plan view. So we drew across, I drew, I drew a cross section through the site and then we went through and um, modified some of the original plans that have been brought in. So you'll see here, although it's kind of hard to see because of the scale, what we're trying to do is use the cars at the lowest level on the parking lot. So in section AA, I'm going to start at the building on the right. Oh, there's a pointer, isn't there? Yes, I just lasered myself. Let's see if my 45-year-old hands are any good at this still. So this building here, Nervous Nelly. Not really nervous. So I'm going to be talking from here to the right. So what happens is we're trying to screen, wow, that shaky hand, that lower terrace there. When you think about being in the units at that level, when you look out, a uh, common strategy here would be to have cars. Well, first you have the landscaping that's between the building and the cars, right? So everybody, we call that foundation planting. You have it around your house. Everybody has it. We have it. Not really of consequence. We do have a tree there to help the second story buildings, uh, ornamental tree, a medium sized flowering tree. And then we have the double banked parking lot there. So as Todd was mentioning, we need to cut into this hillside before we can get up to phase one. Our site is sort of in the plateau between Hartford Healthcare, which is lower, and the phase one project, which is up higher, right? So we're, we're not really sitting in the middle of that but we are still in context, you know, sitting in that sort of middle of the cheesecake. So the, retain, the first retaining wall that you see there is actually gonna be screened by cars. So it doesn't make any sense to put landscaping between the cars and the wall. It's literally a waste of money. You would never see the landscaping and they would get backed into and then the plows would come through and wipe them all out. And as a Buffalo native, I can speak to plowing. So we deal with snow. Um, so what the strategy was there is, okay, we're going to maximize our landscaping ability by using the cars to screen the wall because they're going to be there anyway. Above that wall, this wall was pr originally higher than it's shown now. We've knocked about four feet off of that wall. And there's a slope there now, a three to one slope, and we're planting that slope so that when you look above the cars, there will be plants that sort of droop over the wall. So the top of the wall is going to be screened with some plants as well. Then we have, I think, 10 feet of landscaping there, another row of ornamental trees, and that blocks the cars on that terrace. Okay, so we've blocked the bottom, we're blocking the second terrace, and then the third terrace, which is actually the access drive up at the top on the right, there's a two wall system there, and each terrace has landscaping on it. But Similarly to the bottom one, we're going to use the cars to block the bottom wall because obviously people are going to be parking there. So it doesn't really make sense to do landscaping. So the cars block that one. We put landscaping on the, the second terrace. And then at the very top, uh, I'm going to go back to the plan here, the rendering. Uh, so on the site plan, as you come down the access drive, immediately to the left is a timber guardrail. Behind the guardrail is a row of plants, ornamental grasses. I'd have to look exactly to see what they are. And then behind the ornamental grass is a four foot chain link fence. So before you even get to see the chain link fence, there's going to be landscaping in front of it. Behind that is trees and behind that is landscaping and then you get to the wall. So the whole thing is being uh, landscaped instead of a timber guard rail, lawn, fence wall. So we have screened off sort of that entire thing from the residents and from the people coming down the access drive to the buildings. So it's going to be, it's going to be a pretty nice, pretty nice drive down into there. Can I just for clarification, yep. so from your upper parking mm -hmm. to, again, maybe you could go back to your cross section, would sure. help my mind. Yep. So the far, far right, that's the roadway. The that's entrance. the entrance drive coming down. So at the high, this is at the highest point where the boulevard goes into phase one. Understood. So between that and that next level of parking, you have a, a step, another terrace. Yeah, you see the landscape. Yes. Yep, that's what I thought. So Thank it's you. not a single contiguous wall. Right. There's a lot of benefits to that. It makes the space feel more open. Correct. 
the retaining walls are just less. We require less plants of substance to screen the walls. And honestly, the walls are almost a non-discussion because they're not, it's not, all they become is a minor backdrop to the landscaping that we're putting in front of them. What, are the, what is the average height of each of those walls? They're between, the, I think the maximum is seven, but they're not seven the whole way. So they're between four and seven, okay. depending on where you are. Because it's a very hard to explain site. The parking lot comes up, Tapered, the right. driveway goes down. Right. So that, you know, we had, it's difficult to see, but this cross section really shows you what's going on. Great. So the same thing for BB, you can see how the walls go away. That's at the corner. They taper into the earth. Yeah, yeah. the tapering the gray down. Cause of, so the driveway comes down, but once you go around the corner of the, I'll go back yeah. to the plant. Yep. You can actually see it here really well. Where all of that dense planting comes around that corner, that's where the wall stops. So the wall stops right at the end of the curve. Understood. And they're decreasing in height as you get towards there. So we've really reduced these uh, impacts of these walls down. I suppose that would help headlights into the upper apartments too, won't it? Right. So there's a lot of strategy, and uh, I would like to think that we... I mean, I know we spent a lot of time on strategizing this to add value to the units specifically and to the units to the high side that already exist in phase one. So the, you come down, you go from the um, boulevard from phase one, you go downhill, and as soon as you get around the corner, you're pretty much at grade. So that's going to be a pretty flat, wide open space down at the main entry. Right. And then the walls that go between our site and 95 up at the top there, and I'll go to the sections again. That's the top section, CC, and it runs through there. It seems bad on the plan view, but if you look at the section, it's really not bad at all. It's, it's not like you're <laughs> dropping this thing into a hole. So those are in the planning and zoning set, so you have them if you want to look at them big in more detail. I will add that the plants that we show on here are symbolic on the cross sections to give you the flair and the idea of it. Mm -hmm. To look at what actually is going there, you need to look at the landscape plan to see. So with that said, I'm going to show you some imagery of the landscaping that's going to go in. We've tried to, the original plans had a little less natives in them, and we've since revised the plan for a couple of things to help actually help David and diversity on the site. We originally had an esplanade of Yoshimi cherries, Yukami cherries. I always get that messed up. Anyways, we had a row of cherries that went down the road. And I explained to David, and I'll explain to you that it's phenomenal. And when it's phenomenal, it's phenomenal. But if you lose one, it's not so phenomenal. And the whole thing sort of, pardon my French, goes to hell, right? It's bad. So I suggested to David, and uh, he glommed on to the idea where we will instead mix in some more native uh, regular shade trees. And you can look at the plan to see what all of those are specifically. But essentially, we've broken up this esplanade of contiguous monoculture and diversified the planting plan from the original plan to the revised plans. And we've also taken out some of the other plants and put in similar native species. For example, we're using a single stem amelanchier instead of, uh, I forget, uh, maybe a uh, Zalkova was in there before, but um, the idea was to be more native, use more native species, diversify it for his value, for your value, for the town's value, and provide something that should, for example, if one tree were to go, it's not a big deal anymore. You know, even if you don't replant it. In fact, if you lose one, you might take another one out so it looks right and then replant them with something different. Mm -hmm. That's how succession is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not forever. So there are Princeton elms, which I just like to say that. It's fun to say that we're planting elm trees. Um, they, they're very hardy. They do well. They look like an elm. You know, so not all elms look like an elm, but these look like an elm. They get very large, so we planted them strategically to account for that. So if you have any concerns about the spacing of them, consider what it is that we're putting in there. There is some non-native stuff, but that's really associated with the courtyard, so it's not that relevant. Um, otherwise, uh, I think that's about it for the, 
the landscaping on this, but you can see the flocks that is the purple and white stuff down at the bottom that's going to hang over the walls. Oh. We're also going to put some, uh, it's not juniper, it's called microbiota, but it looks like juniper and it's, it's hardier than junipers. It doesn't have the same salt problems that juniper does. So we're going to use that in most of the um, medians, in the islands for ground cover to minimize maintenance and weeds. So I really overdid it on the landscaping here, but I thought that the sections would be really important to explain to you to help understand what's going on on the site. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? We talked earlier about the walls. Are you the person that's gonna describe what the materials are that, that the walls are comprised of? Yeah, they're a modular block wall, but the point is, is that the design that we're putting forward with the landscaping is specifically based on the material that's being used in that's modular block. Well, so, so modular block. Yeah. Okay. It's a backdrop. And, and they're, they're engineered walls. Yes. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Nice job. Geogrid, all that. I like the strategy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to leave the pretty picture up because it's fun. That's the end. Yeah. I don't know what you did, but. <laughs> My name is Tim Wentz. I am the uh, architect on this project. Uh, our firm's Gate 17 Architecture out of Wall, New Jersey. Uh, I was also the architect on phase one of the project. Uh, this one is actually an easy one to envision because the building is very, very similar to phase one and you're all familiar with phase one. Uh, it's the same materials, it is the same colors, it is the same basic roof line, uh, same shape. Uh, the only difference is that the the types of units are slightly different in that we've got a higher ratio of two bedroom units to one bedroom units as opposed to phase one. That was due to the popularity of the two bedroom units in phase one. And also what we introduced on this project is the ability to have loft units on the top floor. And when I say a loft unit, it is a smaller space which is ex accessed by a staircase from the living area up to the uh, loft area. And most of these lofts are around 10 feet by 20 feet. And what they do is they look down onto the uh, lower level. So we have a high ceiling at that point and what we do is we carry the ceiling all the way out to the front of the building and we create uh, a, a, a form of a dormer, which if you look at this area right here, it's almost like it's a, a covered hood that is in the same shape as a dormer. And what we do is we take the sliding glass door, which is on the first floor, and we put a, a celestial window uh, on the above the, uh, the sliding glass door and what that does is it allows a lot more light into the loft area itself. This is the front elevation and you can see here very clearly how the sliding glass door on the balcony and the celestial window above it and then we have the uh, the roof line, which when you look at it, almost appears to be a gabled dormer. 
Uh, so what we did from, I think, the original rendering that you looked at was that we brought those dormers forward, opened them up, and then allowed the uh, natural light to flood into the units. The entrance area right here is pretty much identical to what we had in phase one. Now this is a section that kind of explains how these uh, dormers work, these loft areas. What you can see on this side more clearly is the roof line as it's sloping up. And here you have your sliding glass door into the living area right here and above it the celestial window which then allows natural light into the loft area right here. Now our building is 50 feet in height from the average grade to the mean of the roof which is this line right here. And to accomplish that what we had to do is to slightly uh, taper off the slope of the roof uh, so that we can maintain that mean height which would be required for the 50 feet. Uh, the interesting thing though is you'll never see that from the ground. All you'll see is the, is the 6 and 12 roof which is sloping up. Excuse me, on that drawing you're showing, is that an air handling equipment on the ridge? We're actually assessing how we're going to handle this air handling equipment and what we're going to do is to bury it into the roof structure itself Okay. So it will not be uh, shown on top of the roof like it is there. Right, because I didn't have it in any of my drawings. So I was just yeah. curious why it showed up there. Yeah, that's a good observation. And will you be doing any solar panels on any of these roofs? We're actually putting solar panels on Harvard Healthcare facility this week. Oh. Um, probably around three months, we'll be putting it on Harbor Heights, the first phase. And I will also be putting it on the second phase as well. Thank you. Good for you. Now again, this is the first floor plan. Uh, we turned it just to keep everybody confused, but the front entrance is located right here, and all the community space is located in this area right here. We have a community room located. We have a fitness center here, and then we have a business center, which is in these locations right here. There will also be, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, small leasing offices, which will handle the, this particular building. So this building has its own community amenities. Uh, it doesn't necessarily share with the first phase. And as in the first phase, this area right here is where your outdoor amenities are. We're going to have a grill station in this location. We're going to have a fireplace a pavilion in this location, the pool itself, and then we'll have a, a fire pit in the back. This is the typical floor. Uh, again, there's not a lot to see here, but what you can see is the different layouts of the, of the units themselves. We have uh, corner units, we've got outside corner units, end units with their balconies which look out into the open space, and then our typical two bedroom unit is located right here. Uh, what we have is six different unit types. Uh, the first one is a one bed, one bath, at 720 square feet. And then we have a one bedroom den, a two bedroom, a two bedroom inside corner, which is this unit right here. A two bedroom den, which is the outside corner, which is this unit right here. And then finally we have the three bedroom end units, which are right here. Now, again, this is the second floor and the third floor. The fourth floor units we did not depict yet. We're still in the process of designing them, but they are the ones that are going to have the lofts. Okay, so those units will be slightly larger than the ones that are on the third floor. This is a picture of uh, one of the existing kitchens in phase one. The finishes will be very similar to phase one in that we're going to have the luxury vinyl tile uh, floors, we're going to have granite countertops, stainless steel appliances. 
uh, as in phase one, uh, each unit has its own HVAC system, its own hot water heater, its own washer dryer. So all of the uh, utilities are controlled and billed to the tenant directly. And this is a good way to use uh, energy conservation. When you're paying your own electric bill, you have a tendency to be a little bit more conservative. This is the uh, west elevation, the sides of the building. Again, you can see we set up a nice rhythm with these uh, areas that are the balconies and the windows for the uh, loft areas. What we've done is we have varied the colors uh, in that we're using a, a medium gray and then we have a, a white uh, white color on the uh, vinyl. Uh, what we have is a uh, shake vinyl for the upper areas, and we have a vinyl plank for the lower areas. These are the exact same materials that we used in phase one. And what we do by varying the pattern of the gray is that we are able to break up the massing of the building so that it appears a lot more interesting and a lot smaller than it would normally be if, if you were looking at a four-story box. This is the opposite side. It's similar to uh, the west elevation. And I want to point out here that the inside elevations are virtually mirror images of these outside elevations. So we're carrying the same patterns of material and color. Uh, again, they have all the balconies which are looking down onto the pool area and the amenity space. And we usually find that the units which look down onto the pool areas are the most popular and the first to go. Now this is the end elevations. Uh, this is the courtyard in the right here and that is the inside of the U shape and this is the two wings which come out you can see that we have our balconies which are facing the open space and these are the three bedroom units here and the three bedroom units here I think one of the questions that were, was originally asked was what do the ends of the building look like and this is a picture of phase one, but it really gives you uh, the, a good feeling for how these interior amenity spaces are. Uh, they're very active in the summertime, very popular. And it's just a nighttime shot. Uh, they light the pool areas up so that it's actually quite pretty. That's the end. Do you have any questions on the architecture? Jeff? The, uh, you mentioned HVAC. Yes. Uh, is it all electric? Yes. Okay, so the adaptation to beneficial electrification is essential in this building. Yes. What we're gonna do is we're going to have a mini split system where we have individual uh, canisters which go on the ceiling, or the top of the wall at the ceiling. Uh, there's one for each major room, so a two-bedroom unit would have three of these canisters. A three-bedroom unit would have four canisters. Uh, and these are all individual, uh, individually controlled by a single thermostat in the unit. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions, Mr. Chum. Thank you, sir. Okay. For the record, I'm Theodore Ladwig. I'm the attorney for Ladizori Development. And I have a very minor role to play here tonight in summarizing or wrapping up our, you know, our presentation. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take you back three months to December 7th, the previous application, application TZ2129RAZC and SPA. You probably remember because it's only three months ago. 
this was the application that allowed us to amend the regulation and the text basically to permit the combining of land that would allow the density to permit another Harbor Heights 2. And I like it when Tim Wentz says that Harbor Heights 2 is very similar to Harbor Heights 1 because my point here is everybody liked Harbor Heights 1. There were over 20 people who signed up to speak in favor of our application on December 7. And I actually think that more than 20 people ended up speaking who had not signed up in, you know, in advance. And my notes indicate to me that over half, excuse me, almost half of the people who signed up to speak were residents of Harbor Heights 1. And they liked it. That's my point. They liked what was, what was created. They liked the living that, you know, that was provided. They liked it. The other people who spoke were, were an interesting mix you know, of, of townspeople, medical people who were using the Hartford, Hartford Healthcare facilities, and some actually lived in Harbor Heights One and worked at the, Har at the Hartford Healthcare facility. I'd like you to keep that in mind as you vote tonight. I, ha having 20 some odd people show up twice in three months is unrealistic. I don't expect them to come tonight, but I would like you folks to remember their, their comments and their testimony back on December 7th. And unless you have any questions for me, that concludes my remarks. Any questions? Just, just one point, and um, you, your applicant will probably have to confer. Uh, you'll probably have to confer with them. But um, to avoid the confusion on this application that, that occurred with, with Harbor Heights 1, uh, would the applicant agree to, to uh, in addition to the as-built plan for the building, filing an as-built plan for the berm when it's completed? <laughs> they, they cannot say no. <laughs> Mr. They just can't say no. The answer has got to be, yes, we'll do an as-built plan for the berm. I'm going to commit them to that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Much appreciated. Any other questions? No. no. Thank you for your attention, folks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. This brings us to the public comment section. Thank you, Keith. Mr. Ladwig spoke. Okay, first up we have a George Webb for general comments. I'll just take these in the order they're written down. Thank you very much. And pardon me, I do not have a visual presentation, so you're going to have to bear with me on looking at the staff report. My original presentation was going to be broken into two portions. Number one, the staff report, and number two, suggested conditions of approval. But I've got several comments regarding the uh, presentation the applicant made. Microphone, please. What? Microphone. Step up the microphone, sir. Oh, let's try it okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Number one on the presentation, are there any architectural renditions of the booster station pump? Not that I've seen. No, just a site plan. The reason I'm asking that, it appeared from the presentation that that was exactly opposite coming out of Park Avenue of the Perkins Reserve. So I believe that that should be a requirement and that the architectural guidelines for the buildings would be applicable to that booster pump station. Number two, I would hope that the trees south of the existing quarter by dust trail and the one that's to be relocated a little bit further south would be left as is or to the greatest extent possible. 
because that's a wild animal habitat. Birds, there are often deer in there, so I would hope that that would be left in its condition. Okay, now if you'll pull out your staff report, Uh, my first comment would be on page 15 of 17. The bottom, it says site access and traffic. It talks about a master plan amendment. The traffic study included both the new apartment and the Hartford Healthcare. My question is, was there a specific traffic study done for Perkins Drive? For this go round? What? For this phase? For this stage. Yes. Yeah, I believe there was. There was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. detailed traffic. That's what I thought. So it taught, it understood the impact of the additional 123 units now. Okay. If you'll turn to page 16, the just second me, If I could interrupt for just yeah. for one second to explain further. The, uh, the traffic engineer, at least this is based on my recollection, please correct me if, if I'm wrong. The traffic engineer had the benefit of actually uh, counting uh, cars in phase one and assume that, that the cross-section of population would be similar in phase okay. two. Right. So, so it had the benefit of, of actually real life traffic counts in right. phase one and they used those in, in making the projections for phase two. So there was a, a, an element of reality in the traffic study. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. The second paragraph on page uh, 16 says, as approved on the 2021 master plan, the proposal will ultimately connect the residential portions of Perkins Farm Development with the medical office portion. And it appears that is not the case in this application. Is that correct? Because, let me take that a step further. My concern is the additional impact on Perkins Farm Drive. And you need to be aware that um, there was an SLR August 23rd, 2001 on page five. It says no internal connection between the apartments and the medical. And there's also, it's interesting that Perkins Farm Drive in several references is a residential driveway. I believe if you look at the town of Stonington guidelines, a residential driveway is to serve less than 15 units. So my question would be, was that constructed to the construction specifications required for say a collector street? Is it of the appropriate width? That's a question. On page 17, talking about public utilities, connections will be brought up through a secondary access road. Where is that secondary access road? We'll have the rebuttal yeah. to okay, answer those that's questions. A, that's a question. Yep. Um, And then further on that page, it says the carports with solar panels on the original submission have been eliminated. Is, then, is it just going to be open parking or are there going to be garages as currently exist in Unit 1? And then my last comment on the staff report, on page 19, under erosion control comments, Item five, and this is going to roll into one of my conditions, suggested conditions of approval. Verify construction access points either from the north paved drive or south from Jerry Brown Drive. Now, having gone through that, I have some proposed conditions of approval. And these are focused on the safety and welfare of the general public with emphasis on residents of the two apartment units 
as well as those residents in the Perkins Reserve. Number one, traffic on Perkins Drive. Speed is an issue there. We, there are approximately 25 dogs, in my, by my count, in Perkins Reserve. Everyone walks their dogs daily. We walk our dog four times a day. You're taking your life in your hands walking on, on that street. Um, again, I mentioned the residential driveway. My concern, as previously mentioned, the uh, width and construction does that of standard to serve the additional 123 units. That road is not striped. So again, speed is the issue, and I would like to see some concerns addressed to this traffic. And the last item for a proposed conditional approval has to do with the walking safety of those with and without their dogs. Currently, there are limited opportunities for the residents in the development and for others to utilize walking trails in that area. There, we need a permanent walking trail, and this would be a, one of my conditions of approval, on the west side of Perkins Farm Drive. On the lower portion, there's a guardrail. Mm -hmm. I would suggest it right be immediately west of that guardrail. And so the guardrail is between the road and the path? No, west of the guardrail. You yeah. have the yeah. road, the guardrail, and then the walking. Right. Yes. Okay. And unfortunately, and going on up further mm -hmm. from the entrance to the Fort of My Dust Trail, take that walkway clear on up and around. And I, I could not understand or hear with clarity the landscape architect's plans for that area where, there, where the walls are, or across from the entrance to the existing Harbor Heights. Finally, regarding traffic, a condition of approval would be there would be no construction-related traffic to use Perkins Farm Drive. That includes construction equipment, construction deliveries of material, and use by the various trades involved in construction. Those need to be accessed off of Jerry Brown Drive. Again, you've got your final lift on, for, on the drive going up there now. That's not going to hold up to heavy construction equipment. Any questions? No, I think we'll have the applicant Thank you. answer those for you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chelsea Leonard, in favor. Good evening, my name is Chelsea Leonard. I, uh, four Plover Lane, Mason's Island. I own and operate three restaurants on the Groton side of um, the river. I'm here to support the second phase of the Perkins Farm project for a few reasons, which I'll highlight for you. First and foremost, uh, brings potential customers to small businesses in the area that, frankly, after the pandemic, need, need more business. Um, we, sorry, yes especially during the winter months. Um, I think that's a really important note considering the tourism traffic is clearly in the summertime. Um, in addition to the tax revenue that it'll bring the town, it will also bring uh, thousands of dollars in sales to local businesses. Perhaps even more important, there's a huge labor shortage and more residents in the immediate area will help fill that void. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, there's a Jim Connolly, not checked off which box. Hi, I'm 
Jim Conley from 12th Park Ave. I'll be very brief, and I'm kind of piggybacking George's comments. Uh, very simply, we've lived one year uh, at, uh, at our address at uh, Perkins Reserve on Park Avenue. Similarly to what George is saying, I think half the our development have uh, dogs, and walking is just a common occurrence. Uh, just from personal experience, uh, the, the speed coming down from the top of Harbor Heights down is significant. And I've had two close misses, personally speaking, and I've heard that com it's common in the, in the area. I guess my point is very brief. Is the possibility of putting in basically two stop signs on Perkins Reserve, where, where Park Avenue comes in and Perkins Farm, making that three stop signs. So that forces people to slow down. And I think from a safety perspective, that would be wonderful in making sure that people who are crossing over to the walking paths can do it safely and having a path there to go across. Because short of that, you know, we're rolling the dice here. And I, th I think it would be a safety concern that would be well met if you did along those lines. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. That was it for the sign-up sheet. Mm -hmm. um, would like to handle the rebuttals for these questions. Again, for the record, Todd Ritchie with SLR. Um, I'll start off by saying, let's see, I'm just trying to think of some of the questions. Oh, as far as the uh, booster station, that booster station is going to be not have a building. It's going to be subgrade. Subgrade. It's a, yes. Can and, you speak uh, just a little closer? Oh, sure. Sorry. Thank you. It's going to be subgrade, and it will have um, essentially uh, it will be pressurized within the pipe with um, uh, with, with lift pumps. Um, so we're going to have some amenities up top that will be screened by a fence, which would just be like um, backup generator and a propane tank, and uh, essentially the, a control panel. Uh, so, uh, which is required. So, so that's that's going to limit that. Uh, and the and I haven't looked closely at the uh, landscape plan in that area, but I imagine we have plantings surrounding it. Would be happy to add more, but it will be it can be a a fence with a with a fabric, you know, so it screens off that that whole area. Um, as far as uh, the intersection that was just mentioned of the two streets with Park Ave and and uh, Perkins Farm Drive. I don't think we've heard much commentary on that before. Uh, Jerry Brown Road certainly was issues with speed, but uh, I spoke with um, the developer and he'd be happy to consider putting in stop signs there, um, you know, to control speed. Certainly want to make sure it's safe and I think something like that would be uh, helpful as well from an engineering standpoint. Um, as far as, um, trying to think sorry uh, as far as oh the roadway itself um, uh, Perkins Farm Drive that is a private road uh, designed to the um, uh, the district state you know the development district standards for a private road um, so and there's no you know there's no there's nothing that's going to impact that from a construction standpoint it would just it's the same quality of materials and it's, it, it may not be exactly the same uh, width as a minimum standard um, town roadway, but um, as far as construction access goes, like at first, as we mentioned, we're gonna try to maximize the amount of um, equipment that goes through the, off of Jerry Brown uh, Road with the existing access that's there, but there will be a time where that's not possible anymore. And there's no way to say that you're going to not have tra construction traffic on, on Perkins Farm Drive. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's just going to have, to have to happen for this uh, development to get built. Um, as far as the walkway along, I think it was, was it Jerry Brown Road, the walkway? Or Perkins Farm? Or Perkins Farm? Perkins Farm. Perkins Farm. Perkins Farm. Perkins Farm. Oh, yeah. um, I can let David speak to that. I, I don't. I don't know how f we do have trails on the site. Uh, certainly, they'll be completed and more uh, established once this is all done and interconnected. And it, it, again, th there'll be a dog park as part of this in the southeast corner. So there's going to be a fenced-in area. So some people will actually have their dogs in there. So that maybe that takes a little bit pressure off of people walking dogs around from the, uh, particularly the new development. Maybe some will be in that area. Some will be walking, but hopefully walking, they're, they're gonna have, from phase two, they'll have direct access to the, the trails that are right there. 
you know, throughout the, what will be open space. Um, so, um, I, again, I'll let David speak as far as uh, extending any pathways further, but um, I don't know. If, uh, as far as other comments, uh, there's some I just I don't really have answers to uh, per se, unless somebody wants to specific, ask a specific question about what was commented on. The town engineer has reviewed uh, our um, proposal in detail. We did receive questions from him. Uh, we've responded. We do have written responses, again, that we couldn't uh, submit prior to this hearing tonight, but we will leave with the town planner that we feel satisfy all of his questions. If anything that's not satisfied, uh, I mean, even as a condition of approval, we'd be happy to say that we, uh, you require us to satisfy the town engineer's uh, comments and concerns. He, he asked about, Mr. Uh, Lord Webb asked about the connection between the medical and the phase two. Yeah. Um, I don't know a history of that, but we are. There is a little part, entranceway, isn't there, between yeah. the uh, There's two. Oh, I don't know the background of it, but we do propose two entrances uh, for phase two. I could go back to that, but we, I, I think I showed them, them before and called them out. Um, we do it, let me well, just One was back. in the parking lot, right? Yeah, one was coming, came through Both of them were the, the parking yeah. lot. I just wanted to highlight something because it's also, uh, it will be a temporary and permanent condition. So we show here, ultimately full build out of phase two for Hartford Healthcare. We will have this entrance connecting to the parking lot as well as this. Right. In the interim, because this will not necessarily be constructed before this, uh, the fire marshal, uh, the fire inspector requested that they have access. So they're the ones that are requesting to have the, I mean, it's re required by fire code to have a secondary access. That's what I thought. Um, so, so we even, you know, initially we didn't show this because we didn't know uh, exactly, David didn't have the time, uh, phasing nailed down, but we feel that this is not gonna be ready for this because we're moving forward with this. So we're gonna be providing a, a gravel, 20 foot wide gravel access to this here with right here is a continuation of this. There's a match line right here. And right where the, this right here is the existing uh, building, end of the existing building. And this is where the road ends now. We will have a gate there so that the emergency uh, access can be um, currently brought through there on this gravel, gravel roadway 20 foot wide over to here. And that will remain until the full build out of Hartford, Hartford Healthcare Phase Two. And he also mentioned a secondary road on page 17. Uh, I don't, I don't know about that comment. Uh, I do. I can tell you again where the utilities will be going to for sewer and water. As I That's mentioned right before, on. the sewer and water go directly from the building to right at this right here. So right, right south of the building. This is the utility corridor now. Right through, right through the property. So that's where the water and sewer main are now, and we're not going any further than that, shortest distance uh, yeah. to get to the building. That's the walking path in the south there, is it not? This is the walking path that we, ha we are relocating. So we're, we're just shifting this over a little bit because we have to grade this slope down it a will, bit over here. So we're, we're shifting it over slightly, and it will be rebuilt, you know, reconstructed. Right. And as you can see, it will join back into this path over here, and then it will just loop around the base of this fill for, for associated with the booster station and reconnect as it is now to the way it is now. So how do the people at, um, uh, in, the, in the townhouses, how do they access that walking path? Right, right now, there, there, there's the walking path reaches the road right here, and the townhouses are right here. Okay. So they do, they just cross the street. Correct. Cross and, and if we propose to have a stop sign there, we can also have a crosswalk. Yeah, that would help. Yeah, would help. Okay. okay. I, I was a little confused. Okay. A crosswalk would help. Mm -hmm. We, we may, I mean, because of, depending on where the road is located, I, sorry, I don't want to beam you in the eyes. Um, we may have to, uh, you know, reconfigure things just to make sure that it's in, in position with the stop sign, you know, for the path. So this, this may come the other way or, or something like that. But we, we want to, you know, make sure that it's in the right place for the crosswalk. I don't know where it lands right now, so I, I don't know the exact, I don't know where the exact location of where that lands right yeah. now next to the, uh, Road. So so now do people walk on in, in the street because it's the winter? Is that what's happening? 
I mean, it sounds that way. I, I can't attest to it, but perhaps um, David can speak to that. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so the cross, so the walking path. And I, uh, forgive me. I haven't been. I haven't sure. walked on the walking path. Are they? Are they walkable in the winter? I mean, it's just like any other for the path. People I mean, who live there. Yeah. Uh, but well, it's a path, you know, through, through over the ground. So, I mean, typically you don't maintain, you know, a stone dust path with, right. you know, I mean, I suppose you could, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, winter months, things change. Some people don't maintain their sidewalks or, yeah, you know, yeah. I was just you know, trying to like understand. that either. Is there room for a path, as Mr. Webb suggested, on the west side of the garden? I, did, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but uh, I mean, I, I think David knows the best because he's, he's very yeah. familiar. I have another question sure. unrelated to uh, the comments while you're, while you're standing sure. up. That way you don't have to get back up. We didn't talk about the lighting. Um, David, do you want us to talk about the lighting? You know, it's my favorite subject. <laughs> yeah, we do have a photometric here. I can speak to site lighting, I don't know about building lighting. So we, we, we did um, lay out um, light poles throughout the site. We can show some photos of what the fixtures are, but as, as needed uh, throughout the site. There was a mention of, uh, let me just go back real quick. There was mention of, um, now that I recall, uh, originally we had um, canopies for parking with solar. Uh, yeah. We're gonna have solar. That was one of Those were removed um, partly because of the economy uh, Economics of it, David looked at it further. He did mention, as you, as you know, that they will be pursuing uh, solar panels for roof areas. On the rooftop. But, but, not, but not that, and there will not be any garages. The grades are not conducive to uh, building garages, nor uh, is there really good um, uh, flat, open, wide open parking areas for that because of the, the grades. Um, so uh, as far as lighting goes, we will have lighting uh, starting from the top of the entrance. You know, light poles are right are these dots coming down uh, here uh, throughout the outside of the building areas, uh, the walkways, all the way in these direction, all those, all those dots that you see, the darker spots, and then spread out in, throughout um, skinny islands, uh, throughout the parking areas, and throughout the medians of the parking areas, um, and, and even in this area, which is the dog park area. This is the... Uh, Photometric plan here, which I can't even see. Oh, does it see oh, details of? Yeah, and these are I, the details. Just, what are you after? Of the I had, there were two two questions that sure. I had really. So you're going to have tiered, which you which was described very very well. Uh -huh. And it's all open parking for these 214 parking spots. Mm -hmm. How many light like the and. Uh, the light posts, right, mm -hmm. on the upper tiers. How are many, you going to be able to see those from Jerry Brown Road? I, I mean, I I don't know. I, I we have vegetation between there and Jerry yeah. Brown Road, but I so. Because that those are the kind of questions. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, John Hammer from the Landscape Architect. So we're required by zoning regulations to have zero zero cut off off of the property. So and you're not allowed to see the point source either. So. Mm -hmm. The answer is no. No. <laughs> no. Okay. And a resounding no. Okay, good. That's good. And then my other question is, so the courtyard is now kind of facing um, away from the highway, right? So the building right. is, is facing this way. So It's facing the wetland. Right. Yes. Um, and you're going to have all the open balconies like you kind of showed in your picture of... Um, Architectural renderings of the first the first building with the pool. Are you going to be able to see those from Jerry Brown Road when the lights are on on the fourth floor, like in the pool and all that? I can't answer that. I was going to say you have the berm, so I don't know how much that kind of blocks out the height. I don't think the room will block that. Oh, I don't know the height. I remember right. they were going to add height. Because remember, it's 50 story. It's 50. I mean, what we've right. established from the viewpoints that were put together at the previous hearing is that the top of the berm pretty much lines up with the top of Hartford Healthcare, 
which is effectively the same height as Harbor Heights. The difference is, is that this Harbor Heights two facility is located around 500 feet further into the interior of the site. Uh -huh. In addition, if we increase the height of the berm another two feet, it's going to hide that even more. But I think what's really important to remember is that the wetland section, which is right here, has the tallest trees on the site. That's where all the old growth trees are. Mm -hmm. It actually provides the most buffer um, of anywhere on this site. We're actually not touching any of those trees. So. Okay. This area right here, we can go to a, a larger. Uh, actually, you can see it here. Mm. This is all tall, 50, 60 foot plus trees. Okay. This is the tallest trees on the site. And when you look at the viewpoint from, you have to get through the berm, you have to get through 60 feet of trees to get to the building 2,000 feet away. Um, you need really x-ray vision to see that from Jerry Brown Road. Okay. It'd be very difficult. It's also 20 feet from phase one. That, right, it's in the ditch. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I think in addition, in addition to that answer, you know, you're going to be standing at approximately elevation 84, uh, if you look at sheet GU2, 84 on Jerry Brown Road. The top of the berm is 102.5, uh, you know, 18 feet higher than than you know the finished grade of the road so um the, the grade at the apartment buildings is about 97. so uh I, I think it would be just you know visualizing the profile of of an average person standing in jerry brown road i think the berm is going to block out everything at 102 feet i agree because so. the berm is so close to the road right yeah, yeah. Triangle. It's a good question, mm -hmm. but but yeah. I do think the berm is going to block, yeah. block it out. From I, I, think it's I also just wanted to be sure because the, the berm is, is literally is is literally uh, ten, feet ten, 10 feet higher than the top of someone's uh, or than the height of I at that point, and um, I, I think it it you know uh, the visual interference of the buildings will be completely screened by someone standing in Jerry Brown Road. Now, that, that I don't necessarily think that's the case of someone that might be in an upper floor unit uh, of the complex across the street. They may see something over the top of the berm, but not uh, a person whose perspective is on Jerry Brown Road. That's going to be screened by the berm. OK, thank you. There's also no on-building lighting or up-lighting. So at night, the only lights that you saw in that picture were just from the units themselves. Um, so it is rather dark. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I have one question, Mr. Chairman, uh, with okay. regard to some trees that, uh, well, both of you are up. I didn't understand necessarily where the trees were that someone mentioned trying to preserve. Did, do you understand that question? Uh, one of the gentlemen that about, stood up yeah. and yeah. got a list of things. One, the one question I don't think we addressed was, uh, certain existing trees, are they going to remain? Did you understand where he was talking about those trees were? I did. So uh, there's a little confusion there. So what he was speaking about is that we originally had cherry trees around along the entire driveway. Okay. He's convinced me, and I, although I like the look of cherry trees, <laughs> um, that if we get some type of insect or something or some type of fungus, it could take out the entire species. So what he said in order to preserve the diversity of this, is he, I should say to preserve the sustainability of the trees, he's added in additional species here. So it's not all cherries. You know, we have different shade trees, we have other flowering trees. I actually plan on continuing these trees all the way down uh, Perkins Farm Drive. I don't know why that wasn't in the first phase, but I plan on doing that to provide additional um, screening and also just enhancement aesthetically. Also, the, the previous town engineer required us to put in a, um, a steel guardrail, which I think is kind of an eyesore. Um, as we mentioned here, we have a wood guardrail, um, which the town engineer finds satisfactory, which I most likely will be tearing out the steel guardrail going down Perkins Farm Lane Drive, and we'll be replacing it with the timber guardrail, which I think will also improve the overall aesthetics and curb appeal of the site. A much softer I, look. I think yeah. that, uh, just to maybe follow up, I think the gentleman was speaking of an already existing set of trees on one portion of the property. 
Yeah, that's what I thought that, too. It sounded like he might know where it is. I, so I was referring to the trees south of the existing corner by dust and the permanent that's supposed to be relocated just south of that. The all of them. Yeah, all the wetlands, all those trees, they're going to be okay. Absolutely, yes. No, no, those yeah, will be you don't have a permit to cut those trees. So. Yeah, can. We can't okay. touch I anything. Think good. I think you're good. You're good. Thank you for the clarification. And then before you sit down, is there anything you can say to address kind of the concerns of the residents as far as walkability on that, on that drive? Yeah, you know, we, we discussed this a little bit many, many years ago, actually under a different commission. Um, and the reason why we didn't put in a pathway there is because there are some stormwater management and grade change issues, which just make it a little technically feasible to install that. But because there were no sidewalks on Jerry Brown Road, I think one of the commission members kind of called it this, or maybe it was Jason Vincent, called it the sidewalk to nowhere, the path to nowhere, because it didn't lead anywhere. Right. I think what's important to remember with this site is that, you know, we're adding an additional 1,500 feet of sidewalks that are going to link um, the current phase over to the existing phase. And they are correct that this is not clear during the winter time. I mean, we could do that. Um, there's already been complaints about the HOA, and we're trying to keep those low. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just kind of a cost-benefit analysis we have to run. I think what we have to do is kind of work as two separate communities is, you know, I have bullet cameras all throughout uh, Harbor Heights, so I can actually zoom in on someone's license plate uh, along the roadway and also leaving our entrance. And we're also going to have bullet cameras and around 15 cameras on this site, which I also have on the first phase. Uh, usually it's an individual t resident. Um, it goes both ways. I'm sure it happens at Perkins Reserve, and I'm, I'm sure it happens at uh, Harbor Heights. But I think it's important that we come up with a way to communicate that between each other. And uh, in terms of putting that stop sign in there, I think that will go a long way towards uh, alleviating some of that traffic stress. I'd rather focus the internal circulations of the site and the walking into the interior of the site, not bringing it out onto Jerry Brown Road, which mm -hmm. is not conducive to walking. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is that you know, the site will be linked uh, eventually to Hartford Healthcare at least for pedestrian access. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that this is kind of a gathering point, which will also link up to this sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So effectively, from Perkins Reserve, we're adding around 3,500 feet of walkways down to Coogan Boulevard. So I, I hope that's sufficient. OK. OK. Sounds, sounds like you've addressed it. And I, I do think you know, maybe working with the, the residents yeah. about this, the stop signs sound like a great idea. With a walkway. The crosswalk. With crosswalk. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I don't know what I know, don't know, but we can catch these guys on camera and we can uh, find them and do whatever else to make so sure So to get a pathway on that um, Perkins Drive is difficult because of the stormwater management culverts and catch basins. Exactly. Because I remember I drove up there a while ago. And there's a spillway. There's some it, other stormwater functions get, that we need you to preserve. Your pathway would be interrupted or you would have to be going down into the spillway. Correct. I mean, we were able to move all the stormwater management away from the communities, but as a result, it does break up that driveway. Mm -hmm. It would be difficult for a walkway to go through there. Yeah. There's also a physical restriction. The town just doesn't have a wide enough right-of-way. The right-of-way isn't wide enough. So. That's a private road. So. I don't think I don't think no, you could do no, it. No, I was just yeah. going through the right. Yeah. Okay. You know, we discussed this all three years ago, and this was unfortunately one of the compromises we mm -hmm. had to make. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. There was a question that he presented about the sidewalk and how it worked with the retaining walls that were up against ninety five, where we come around mm -hmm. and down into the site. Oh, oh, for the yeah, grade, for I don't think handicap. we've addressed that, and I can address it. That's your question, Chuck. Yeah, on the eight, for the ADA, I think it was a yep. great question you had. Chuck, he's trying to well, answer your question. Well, the gentleman, I'm sorry. he's trying to answer your question about yeah, grade. Oh, that, that was answered, but I don't think it was, I don't think he understood, <clears throat> I don't have your name, but I don't think he understood how the sidewalk worked in relationship to the, to the road and the walls that are on there. Okay. So I'm just going to show that it's obviously 
very far away from you, but if you look at it, you can see there is the road, there is a two or three foot grass shelf, like a traditional road, and then there is a sidewalk, and then there is a six foot or eight foot, there is a landscape strip, and then there is a retaining wall. Huh. So we did not do road, sidewalk, wall, which would be very uncomfortable to walk in. There is a road, a grass strip, mm -hmm. then a sidewalk, mm -hmm. then a landscape strip, uh -huh. and then a six foot wall with landscaping in front of it and behind it. So, I mean, in a personal opinion, I wouldn't mind walking there, but um, it's definitely, there are definitely far worse solutions that could have went mm -hmm. into that space. Well, how so. does that address the slope though? Well, we can't control the 20 foot grade change between Harbor Heights 1 and Harbor Heights 2, this, this middle phase. We have to get down there. We have to go down from the boulevard. I understand, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Right. There's a grade change, so, can't so control the road it. has to make that transition. Yes. I understand that, that you know, there are certain things that are out of your control yes. in that process. But, but the sidewalk is, is a separate entity. Why couldn't you introduce landings into the sidewalk an appropriate distance apart just to take the curse off that slope for someone who might be wheelchair bound because they're not separate entities the profile of the sidewalk follows the profile of the road identically the top of the curb so you have the gutter line the top of the curb there's two feet between the curb and right. the sidewalk so i couldn't reasonably differentiate the profile of the sidewalk from the road you would end up with a very strange transition between the sidewalk and the in the road it wouldn't really work. I'm not sure I agree with that, but, but uh, if you could examine it and see if it's feasible, um, I, I think it's done frequently. And uh, if you take a look at it, you don't have to have a 20-foot landing, just a very brief landing. And in that, in that distance, the slope isn't, isn't going to, you don't have to take the curse off a huge slope. You simply don't Yeah, have so to. we would come down at the profile of the road, and then we would try to introduce a 2% landing, which should be about five feet for, an, for a landing. Okay. So the rule is you go 30 feet for a ramp, and then you do five feet for a right. landing, right? That's ADA standards. Right? ADA standards. If we weren't to follow the quote unquote ADA standards and we tried to introduce something that was uh, representative or better than this, we would be at some point along the road introducing a five foot ramp next to a road profile that's contiguous and we would have to try to insert a landing in there. I don't think you should try to design it here. All I'm asking is that you look at the concept and see if it's feasible. We'll look at it. It, it, it just, you know, I, I understand to, what you're saying. Not, not take a look at it is, is uh, you know, especially in view of what we've heard here is that that this is, is now going to become a primary walking room. We'll look at it. For people my age. <laughs> I'm not far behind. <laughs> we'll look at it. Okay, thank you. Keith, I guess that's the staff. Sure. As you know, um, you know this is part of the Greenway Development District, and back in December, the the master plan was approved that showed this building. So a lot of the basics are already answered, of course, at this point. That you know the buildings at least conceptually approved here. So this site plan application is more about ironing uh, ironing out the details. Um, as far as comments received, you know, the most recent one was uh, this application was reviewed and approved by the Architectural Review Board just last night. Um, and they reviewed it at two meetings. Um, the plans were revised to meet that board's comments, which were their main concern originally was to reduce the height of the retaining walls, which were originally proposed to be more like 20 feet in certain areas. So um, that board encouraged them to develop the modifications that you saw here with the tiered retaining walls and seemed to be uh, to, to enhance the site design. 
Um, they also approved it just with the stipulation or a recommendation that the, um, the fence is, is lowered to 48 inches, which the developer agrees with. I think the town engineer was looking for a six foot fence in a certain area. Um, as far as other comments we received, we got uh, extensive comments from the town engineer. But, excuse um, me, Keith, before we get there, is the police commission commented? Because the, the police the commission engineer's comments are going to go on for quite a while. The police commission uh, reviewed this a few days ago, and I do not have their comments. Okay, we hadn't, in our package, hadn't received anything. You um, have I don't either? know if the applicants were at the meeting and can, can fill us in, but uh, I'm actually not sure how that went. David, do you have any input on police commission? It was already approved for the master plan application, so they had no new comments for a site plan application. Okay. We already went through the traffic ad nauseum at our previous sure. hearing for a master plan modification based on the traffic report that was prepared. Right. Okay. Thank you. All righty, Keith. Yeah. And the, um, the town engineer um, did recommend that the commission um, could approve this with the stipulation that the final plans be uh, reviewed uh, in light of his comments. Um, same thing with the Old Mystic Fire District that said zoning approval is recommended, but um, had a bunch of individual comments that they'd like to look into some more. But I'd like to backtrack to the uh, engineer. He has three sections. Mm. First yeah. one with numbers one through 14, erosions number one through eight, and drainage numbers one through 15. <laughs> right. Is Very the applicant thorough. ready to handle all those different questions and agree to them all? You have all those in the stipulations uh, one through seven, correct? In the record. Right, right. Yeah. They all are in the, your stipulation? Mr. Chairman, um, we've already addressed those. We were not permitted to submit those within the 15-day period. Right. We have copies with us tonight. Happy to submit them after the meeting okay. to the town planner. And of course, whatever is not resolved, we'll resolve that as a condition of approval. Perfect. Sorry, Keith. No problem. It's the same with the Old Mystic. The same with the old Mystic Fire District, where they wanted to go over some of the uh, side access some more with the final plan. Uh, as far as the recommended stipulations, there are some here. Um, number one, that the final plan shall be recorded prior to the issuance of any zoning permits. Number two, the final plan shall be reviewed to the satisfaction of the town engineer, town planner, okay. and Old Mystic Fire District regarding previous review comments. Number three is the um, language regarding the erosion and sedimentation control bond. Uh, number four is a stipulation of uh, the design engineer of record providing inspection services, certifying that all the stormwater uh, features were, were done uh, appropriately. Number five, uh, the stipulation to get the Connecticut DEP general permit for discharge of stormwater and dewatering wastewaters from construction activities. Um, for developments that are large enough, that's sort of a, a state level uh, permit you get to, uh, as another check on um, erosion and sedimentation control. Uh, number six, the applicant shall verify with the Office of State Traffic Commission as to whether the development's existing permit needs to be modified. Any modification to this permit shall be provided to the town prior to construction. Um, similar to the DEP general permit, um, developments that are large enough over a certain size need that state level review because they might um, affect the state's road system. Um, the development in general already went through that process but um, you know, the state may need to re revisit that in this phase. And number seven, just that the lots that comprise this development phase shall be combined prior to the approval of a zoning permit for construction. Um, and what I heard from Mr. Sheehan was uh, number eight, that uh, as built 
an as-built plan shall be submitted for the berm prior to a certificate of zoning compliance. Um, there were some other ideas thrown around, but that's the, Could we the basic we've got so far. Being the uh, continuation of the uh, the stone wall, uh, so that that uh, within its existing footprint uh, along the frontage, it's it, it is rebuilt uh, to match or uh, enhance uh, or to match the the stone wall that's there or or some other concept that's an equivalent. There was also one other thing discussed, and that was regarding the pump house uh, for the domestic and fire suppression water, uh, that that uh, the architecture uh, be reflective of the the building. Um, and uh, I thought it was going to be underground. I think he said he, they were, it's going to be underground. It was going to be underground, and they'll have a screening. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Fence. Yeah. Just around up real quick. Yeah. Right, so that's will... totally subsurface. Correct. In yeah. a vault. Yes. I'm sorry, I missed yeah. it. Sure. Thank you. But I would like to put number 10 as the stipulation about the stop sign and the crosswalk. Yeah, that's Could we include one. that, please? Is that that's nine, I think. Yeah, that would be nine. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I thought nine was your stone wall. He meant eight, actually. That was eight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, eight, it was. eight was the uh, as built for the berm. berm. Okay. Nine, okay. Nine so nine was the stone wall. I think wall. you're right. It is ten. Oh, okay. Yeah. I apologize. So this is stop sign at intersection of Perkins Farm Drive and Perkins Reserve with crosswalk. So just just checking with the applicants, is the stop sign the stop signs at that section definitely doable, or is it something? Okay. Any other questions for Keith? Do we close the program? Yeah, I was going to say, do we have to close the hearing before we vote? If, if, I think we have to ask if there's anyone else that wants to speak, right? Right. Mars, do you want to? I'll start. And Keith, you're all? Yeah. You all have a team to close the meeting. Nope. Oh. I move we close public hearing, Mr. Chairman. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I meeting closed. I move this uh, approval of this application uh, pursuant to the uh, ten stipulations that we uh, just discussed in in open session and are all agreeable to the applicant. Seconded. Discussion. Good job. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, nobody's opposed. So moved. Any other business? No. Meeting adjourned.